Thank you for your interest in the special audio recording of a Teach 2016 workshop. This audio file is a free resource from USA Canada Sunday School and Discipleship Ministries Regional Office. Recorded at a 2016 Teach Conference held at Springdale Church of Nazarene in Cincinnati, Ohio. We extend appreciation to the presenter who gave permission for the recording to be distributed as a training resource and pray that it will be a blessing to your ministry. If you have any comments about the content or quality of this recording, please send them to stmi.nazarene.org or call 1-877-240-2417. couple in here they were sitting right here and and uh, did he tell you <laughs> that's gonna be one of my better stories of where I, be careful how you name your workshop oh that's really good well anyway this is for those of you that you think you might be in the right place this <laughs> workshop is about biker ministry not about open heart surgery but the reason that I, I put it I titled it this was because as all of us know that ride you have, an, you have a connection to people that ride. There is just a natural connection. If you ride, no matter what brand of bike it is, if you're on two wheels or three wheels, and you hang out with bikers, you have a connection. You already have that. And so that's, I, I kind of named this open heart surgery because you've already got an open heart. It's not like you have to introduce anything to them. Um, but here's what it takes. It's not rocket science. Uh, it's a ministry to people, not their bikes. A lot of biker ministries get all tied up in the bikes and, and the, the brands and all that kind of stuff. This is a ministry of people, uh, and they're just like everybody. It's not brain surgery, although having one is handy. Uh, uh, I've seen some guys try to try to get into biker ministry, and some ladies too that that almost did it without a brain. And and uh, what they were doing mostly was focusing on that first one instead of the second one. So uh, it, it's that way. It's not complicated, but it's easy to get lost. There are a lot of things that can distract you in biker ministry other than the ministry. And again, it comes around to the bikes and all the things that go with the bikes and, and preconceived notions and all that. It requires a couple of things. It requires that you're accepting of muddy people. Now, where does that come from? There's a book that I want to encourage you to take a look at if you're in biker ministry. It's called Mud the Masterpiece. It's by John Burke. Uh, it's an excellent, uh, and I've got that written. I've got the information written in your, your handout there. Uh, I want to read you just a bit from this. He, talks, he tells a story about a couple that come to his church and they're messed up. They're, they're living together. She's pregnant now. So that they, they fit the pattern of people that often come to from outside that, that don't know anything about Christianity. And he says, he says, if you talk to people who seem far from God, many tend to admire Jesus but often can't stand his followers. Jesus still has an intriguing and mysteriously attractive pull on people. But many Christians re, uh, create a repelling force. That's troubling, especially when you consider how Derek's and Zoe's, the couple that he was talking to, uh, of Jesus' day felt a magnetic attraction towards us. You think about the, the prostitutes, the drunks, the sinners, the tax collectors, the lawyers, all these people that weren't Pharisees, that weren't in the church, were attracted to Jesus. And why were they attracted? It was because he loved them. And he went out of his way to, to, men, to minister to them. In fact, Luke tells us all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near and listening to him. The Pharisees, religious leaders, called Jesus a glutton, a drunk, a friend of sinners to discredit him, mainly because Jesus had an enormous life-giving impact on the Derricks and the Zoys of that period. So ultimately, the impact we have on people around us tell us if we're more, are we more like Jesus or are we more like the Pharisees. Uh, so why do we struggle to treat people as immensely valued, one-of-a-kind masterpiece that God created. And so when I, when I speak about the mud on people, it's mud that we put on people and that people put on themselves. And what we needed, what Jesus did in his time was he looked through the mud to the masterpiece. 
because his father had created this masterpiece that is within all of us. And so when, when we look at bikers and we look at the kind of folks that we hang around in biker ministry, there's a lot, they got a lot of mud. I mean, they got a lot of junk on the outside. Our eyes need to not focus on the mud or we don't need to be the ones applying more mud because that's what they expect. We need to see right through the mud of the masterpiece. So when, when, when I talk about this stuff, it requires that you are accepting of muddy people that's, that's who Christ has called us to go to, people with mud on them, people with things that are covering up the masterpiece that he's made. Now, in your notes uh, that you have, your printed notes, I have the word note there. Do you have another Yeah, yeah, right over there. Sorry. Oh, okay. what, I want, what I want you to do where it says note, in this particular one, who, who do you know? You know a person. You know a muddy person that is in your circle of influence, that comes to your church or comes to your biker events or you see it at a poker run or you see it different things that you do. You know somebody. A great way to start a biker ministry is by focusing on somebody or a family or a group of people. So those notes are for you to write down, who do you know? Put a name to it. That way you've got to focus on it. Uh, it requires you to see through the mud to the masterpiece that's inside. Now. We don't do this very well as churches because we tend to have social and, and cultural things that take place in our churches that tend to put mud on people. You're not like us. Get your act together. Get yourself cleaned up. Then you can be a part of us. If you're into biker ministry or any sort of outreach ministry, you know that these people aren't church people. And so we need to see them the same way that Jesus saw them. We need to see through that mud and into that person. It requires a long-term passion to see through it no matter what. Uh, it, and, and here's the reason it's open. It's open heart because the heart of every biker is already open to every other biker. It doesn't matter where you go, even if you find yourself uh, in an uncomfortable situation perhaps, where you're, you find yourself in a club situation, where you're around some outlaw guys. Uh, they pull up at a gas station, you're at a gas station, uh, you've got your cut on, they've got their cut on, and you're not exactly sure, what should I do here? Well, the thing to do is, everybody respects everybody. And you don't treat them any different than they treat you, you just respect them, they respect you. For some of us who are Christians, that's difficult to do because one of our first attitudes is an attitude of judgment. Uh, and you think that that doesn't come across but it does come across without even saying a word. So we need to be able to, to respect people where they are. If you go into a mission field and you don't know the language and you don't know the protocol and you don't know the customs, you're going to be in trouble right off. And so what we try to do in NMF is we try, and in these workshops, is we try to encourage people, learn as much as you can before you get into this ministry so that you understand the protocol, the language, the kinds of things that you would need to know in order to actually respect the culture of someone else. Doesn't mean you have to agree with it, but you have to respect it, in other words, for them to respect you. Jesus did that. He showed them love. Uh, so I, I wanted to give you that, uh, the information I gave you about that book is, is in your notes there. Uh, when I said it requires a long-term passion to see it through, it means that there's going to be some sticky times. There's going to be some times when you just think it's not working uh, and you're ready to give up. And uh, I'm going to throw it to Ron. Uh, one of the things that I did, Ron has a ministry uh, called 321? 234. And he'll explain what that is. I, I, I put out a, a thing on Facebook. The NMF Associates, we tried all sorts of different ways to get us to talk to each other and to share things with each other. It's, it's the hardest nut to crack I've ever tried. I mean, we've done newsletters, we've done emails, and we've done uh, MailChimp, and we've done all this kind of stuff to get people to respond and say what you're doing in your biker ministry. Finally, at the last NMF meeting, we said, hey, Facebook, almost everybody's on Facebook. Let's just do that. So we started an NMF Facebook page encourage all the associates, join, just like it, and you're there, and, and then we can share back and forth. So before I came down last week, I sent out a message on the NMF Facebook account. We've got like 290 associates that are on there pretty regularly. So I send this out, and I say, hey, we'll be at the Teach Conference. I'm going to be teaching on open heart ministry, biker ministry. So share with me some things that are happening in your biker ministry that are good, some things that maybe aren't so good. Well, out of 294 people, 
And out of 88 that actually looked at the post, four responded, four wrote something back. So I mean, that's just the typical kind of response you get. So anyway, Ron was one of them. And uh, I'm gonna get Ron to share what he shared because his was not exactly a positive thing. Uh, although in, uh, in Albert's message this morning, there was a part in Albert's message when he talked about the bamboo where one year, nothing, two years, nothing, three years, nothing, four years, nothing, five, six years, something starts to happen. Uh, Anna was sitting next to him and I said, poke him. <laughs> so she poked him and I went like that. So and don't you hate it when people hear truth and you're sitting next to them and suddenly, okay, I heard it, you know. Ron, share with us about what's going on in your place. Well, so I was trying to pull up, I was going to read what I, what I actually posted, but for whatever reason I can't get to the page. Um, but the bottom line is that uh, I started 234, uh, 234 is uh, two wheels, three nails, four given. Um, I started it with a, a couple of buddies of mine from church. Um, we uh, actually met um, through church because of the motorcycles and, and uh, um, have forged a, a friendship over the last number of years. And, and uh, about two or three years ago, um, I had the idea, um, actually sitting, sitting in church doodling on the back of my bulletin, you know. Listening to the pastor, of course. <laughs> for what... Uh, <laughs> For, uh, yeah, I was listening. Yeah. Um, was doodling on my bulletin, and, and uh, you know, I, I, I had the idea. I said, you know, I'm feeling a little bit of pressure to, to do something. To, to, I mean, we needed to have. I needed a place to plug in, and, and something that was that was unique to my interests and and, uh, and everything that way. Um, so, talking with a couple of fellows, and and uh, you know, we decided that we could we could start something within the church and, and uh, you know, we, so we, we started 234. Um, since then we've had, you know, I, I schedule and I plan, um, you know, a ride, try and put stuff on paper on the calendar and, and uh, you know, we've had several events and, and most of our events are fairly well attended. Um, but what I've found is that while I have several people in the church who enjoy the camaraderie, they enjoy the bike, they enjoy getting together, I don't really have that that core group of participants that are that are really willing to to do the ministry. You know, everybody wants to come along and, and do the fun stuff without um, you know participating in the ride planning or, or being a ride captain or um, you know doing some legwork to, to give us some shape. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, that's that's where we've been struggling here recently. And, and uh, you know, I mean, like I said, we, we all enjoy to get together and, and go on rides. But I feel like, you know, 234 specifically is, is lacking the purpose. You know, because, I mean, a anybody can join a riding group. Um, but being a, a ministry, you know, that, I mean, that, that's where, that's where I feel like we're falling short, because I don't know, you know, I mean, the people that ride with us are, are church people, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just, I, I'm feeling like, I'm feeling like this year we're, we're really starting to, starting to, to turn the corner a little bit, as it were, but, but still, um, you know, we, we are, we are church people yeah. doing, doing church with motorcycles. Yeah. Wayne Chiselka is, a, is a, a fellow that's been doing ministry. He came to, to one of our Biker Sundays in North Carolina, went back and started one at his church, and it, it blew up into some an unbelievable thing there in Midland Valley Church Nazarene in Clearwater, South Carolina. Uh, and he writes this in response to Ron's. He said, I believe what your experience is common. We, dri we had driven by the Spirit, have, a, have been established for 12 years, and we too have similar issues. It's called life, and most regular bikers have so many things going on, careers, family, et cetera, that bike groups aren't a priority. He said, stick with it. Decide how far you go with it. Figure out if it's a ministry or maybe just a small group. If it's of God, it will work itself out. And we found that to be so at Full Armor in, uh, in Columbus. If people say, how many people are in your biker group? I said, well, if we feed them, there's almost 40. 
but if we just have a Bible study, there's about eight. Uh, and so people are drawn to whatever they can fit into their schedule. And usually if it's an activity like a ride or a, or a feed or something like that, they'll make that a priority. They'll come in. And you just have to take that for what it is, and you have to build upon it. Because in, at one of those meals or one of those rides, and you never know when that seed's going to be planted, that bamboo shoot's going to be planted, and it finally sprouts, and it finally takes. So you can't stop. You've got to keep going. And I know it's depressing. Now, now here's what Wayne Chiselka wrote. This is the one that just commented on Ron's. He said, David, I believe a big issue is just what biker ministry looks like in your church. For us, it was big in the area and the church for the first eight years or so. We were basically the only ministry in the area, but things have changed. Ministries and so-called biker churches have popped up. Bikers are getting saved and attending other churches. So they're doing the same thing that we do in church. You get saved here. You become a member of the church, then you get mad at Jesus or you get mad at somebody in the church and you go to another church who hasn't made you mad yet. And so we just keep swapping churches and swapping members. And the same thing happens in biker ministry because biker ministry is a church with narrower parking spaces. I mean, that's, that's basically the difference because after all, it's still people. They still have families. They still have attitudes. They still have problems. So Wayne says, they serve the church in a variety of other ministries, which is a good thing. So for us, introducing bikers to Christ and then disciplining them, disciplining them to serve and to be a part of the bigger church, even at the risk of losing members to other biker ministries. God did not call us to build the church. He called us to disciple people. And that's been the, that's been the focus of this whole teach conference is, is sharing one for one and discipling. And, and that's what it is. Steve Phillips says, one thing that I see that Hearst Church is promoting as being biker friendly is the way they look down their noses at anyone that isn't wearing a suit. I don't see that so much anymore. Uh, it, I think that's kind of gone by the way, but I can remember when we first started Biker Ministry, it was kind of that way, and it was a big deal. When we had our first Biker Sunday at Powerline in, in North Carolina. There were guys there that I'm almost positive because I made them wear a T-shirt and a do-rag at our first Biker Sunday. I'm almost positive it was the very first time they'd ever not worn a tie in church on a Sunday morning. And they came up to me and said, this is very uncomfortable for me. You know, if my mama were still alive, she would not like this at all. Mm -hmm. But after that, after they found out, hey, I can still, wor I can worship in a t-shirt. I don't, the tie is not a part of my spirituality. That kind of started changing the church. And so it, you know, it can be a good thing too. It can be a good thing for a church. Pre-op. Pray that this is not just a new thing because you think you need a new thing. Uh, a lot of ministries start because somebody came to a conference and they sat in a workshop and they go, oh, that's good, we can do that and let's do that. And they don't have a passion for it. They don't have a real calling for it. And it will die, it will die off pretty quick. Uh, ride your bike to places where people who ride, ride. Don't just ride with your church folks. Uh, if there's a poker run in town, if there's a charity ride, if there's a teddy bear ride, if there's a uh, Toys for Tots ride, you and the folks from your ministry need to be there. Now, you don't need to be there to save people. You just need to be there to be a friend. Be there to be a part of the biker culture in your area. Be involved in the biker community. Bars, uh, your hall group, if you were out of Harley, you need to be a member of your hall group. Uh, there is tremendous influence in that hall group because there are people that are influential in your town that are riding Harleys. They finally got disposable income. They finally can afford to buy a bike. They go out and make huge mistakes. They've never ridden a bike before, and they buy the biggest one they can get. Uh, and they lay it over, and they, you end up visiting them in the orthopedic ward. One of the things that happens in bars, if you go into a bar as a biker, and one of the reasons I'm tatted up the way I am is because when I go into a bar, I don't have to say anything. Who I am is on my skin, and that's what they look at. Now, the, the, the reverse of that is who I am is on my skin, and if I don't live up to that in that bar, they will call you on it in a heartbeat. They see that cross on your back. If you're allowed to wear your cut into a bar, some bars you're not able to, and just make sure you read the signage on the outside, no colors, no cuts, you know, that kind of thing. But if you're allowed to and they see that, you know, if an outlaw biker sees a cross on your back and you don't rep that cross, uh, they will let you know about it uh, really, really quick. Uh, be real and be available as a friend. Uh, don't try to be a pastor. Don't try to be religious. Try to be a friend. Uh, find yourself a doctor. Find somebody else that you can draw from. 
have somebody, even if they're not a biker, have somebody in your church or somebody in your family that can back you up in prayer. That's extremely important because if you start going into bars, you will be tempted by the things that are in the bars. And the things that are in the bars are very tempting. Uh, and so find yourself a doctor, somebody you can confide in, somebody that can take care of you. The first incision, find somebody who needs what you have. Ministry is to people and to people's needs. Ministry is not to groups of people, it's to individuals. Your biker ministry opens you up to a whole load of biker or a whole load of people that have a commonality with you, but they don't live where you live. You don't live where they live. Your only commonality, even though it's a strong one, is a bike, but it stops there until you become a friend. Be there with your story. You have a story that is unique to you and it speaks volumes. You know, I don't carry a Bible when I go into a bar because that puts a wall up immediately. But I do have my story. And if somebody is, is, is sitting with me and I'm drinking a Coke or a cup of coffee and they're having a beer or whiskey, whatever, you know, we share stories. That's what you do. You, you talk to people and they want to know your story. You have to listen to a lot of junk, you know, for their story, but they're listening to your junk too. And it's just a matter of sharing. Don't make it a church thing. This is really important. Don't go into a place or even into a relationship with a person with the expressed intent of adding somebody to a Sunday school role or adding somebody to a church membership because they will see through that in a heartbeat. They'll see that you're just collecting trophies. You don't want to do that. You want to be a friend. You want to make it a real thing and you want to mean it. You want to mean to be a friend. Don't go in and try to be a friend with the thought of on down the road, hey, they'll eventually come to our church. Be a friend because you want to be their friend. Uh, as a pastor in the bar, uh, and Cheers is the best show I think that was ever on TV because, you know, people want to go where everybody knows their name. That's what church is to church people, but that's not what it is to bar people or to people that have never been in a church. They just want to know that somebody here knows them. Can you imagine the impact that you would have if somebody that never went to a church anywhere, doesn't have a church family, they've all got mamas or grandmas, and somebody's going to go to the hospital pretty soon and get sick. If you're in the bar and they say, man, my mom went to the hospital today, where she's at? Can I go visit her? You go in there and visit her? You did that because you're a friend, not because you're a pastor. That speaks volumes to that person because nobody's doing that for them. People who ride have lives off the bike. You know, I love to ride. I'd, I'd rather ride than eat. Uh, but my bike's been broke down, so I've gained a little weight. But, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, you know, but they have lives off of that bike. Their bike does not identify who they are. But we often do that. We often identify somebody with what kind of bike they've got. That's not who they are. That's just what they ride. Uh, they have families. And see, here's the thing. And for us pastors, even though I say, don't look at them as a trophy, don't look at them, but that's what Christ, it's instilled in us, it's what we think. You know, we think, oh, I'd love to get them in a relationship with Christ so they can come to my church. You know, it's just what we think, but it doesn't have to be that way. They've got families, they've got problems, they've got the same kind of junk we've got. They have needs, they have hurts, and they have a story. One of the best things that you can do to somebody, or with somebody, or for somebody, is listen to their story. Don't offer yours yet. Just listen to theirs uh, and, and find out what it is they're going. The diagnosis, once in a no one is completely gone. Man, I've met some guys. We had a guy come to our church. His name was Jimmy, Jimmy Calhoun. Uh, his brother went down and picked him up off the street in Austin, Texas. Uh, he had OD'd three or four times on heroin, brought him to uh, our third or fourth biker Sunday in, in uh, North Carolina. Uh, the guy came in. Mike came in. And by the way, Mike and Jimmy and Brenda are now running the biker ministry in North Carolina. After I moved to Ohio, they were so faithful. I said, would you guys consider picking up the baton and running with it and keeping it going? Uh, Jimmy is clean and sober. Uh, he is now part of that biker ministry. So when Mike came inside, he said, hey, my brother's here. He's out in the parking lot. And uh, so me and another, he came in and talked to me and another guy, and he said, I said, well, how will I know him? He went, oh, you'll know him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and there's like, 800 bikers in our parking lot outside. I mean, there's every shape and form and size you can imagine. Jimmy stood out. He was emaciated. He was, you can clean up an addict to where physically they're clean, but you can still see them. 
you can still see the drugs, you can still see the hard times they've had, you can still see a street person, a person that's just been wasted. And we saw him. And so we went out, we introduced ourselves, and to this day, Jim remembers that day as the day that somebody came out and just wanted to meet him because he was there. They didn't want to pick him up, they didn't want to sell him anything, they didn't want to haul him off anywhere, they didn't want off the parking lot because you're messing up our day. We just went out and we met him. And, uh, and we, we worked with him, we hung out with him for a while, now he's there. Uh, as long as there is life, there is hope. When we met Jim that day, there wasn't much life. Trust me, I mean, he was, he was about as far gone as you can get and still be aware of where he was, if you know what I mean. Uh, and then, again, your story. What brought you back? People that aren't in church think that everybody that's in church has been in church their whole life, and they've always had their act together. They don't realize that many people that are in church were where they were, and we all have a story. We all have a story of where we go. I mean, and I've been in the church my whole life, born on the campus of Trevecca Nazarene University, and yet I've got some stories about my life where I have turned and walked the other way, and I have done some things, and those kinds of stories, people go, you're kidding, man, dude, you're a pastor. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm a human too, you know, and I've had those days. Uh, the hard part is staying with it, and literally, folks, that is the hard part of any ministry, not just biker ministry. It's the hard part of children's ministry, recreational ministries, music, everything. It's hard to stay with it. You've got to be driven. Not getting others mud on you. When you go into a bar, just be careful. Uh, we call it the thin gray line. There's this line that you cross, and if you cross that line, people are watching you to see if you cross that line, to see if you get other people's mud on you. Keep the vision and keep the passion. Uh, passion is the thing that drives biker ministry. Uh, you've got to love it. You've got to love it more than anything. Uh, and it's just like anything else that you do with passion. You've got to make sure that it's, it's what you love uh, and there isn't anything that you'd rather be doing than that. Uh, and then what happens after? Uh, Post-op. Uh, stay, with, stay with a friend regardless. You, you know some people in your church that you'd just soon not be around because they're jerks. Uh, you know, they, they say one thing, do another, or say they're going to do something, they never do it. Well, you're going to have friends outside the church that are exactly the same way. Well, you don't throw your friends at church away because they don't follow through. Don't throw your friends outside the church away because they don't follow through. Be a friend regardless. Stay a friend. Lead with integrity. Uh, you, you've got to know where you stand. You've got to know who you are. Uh, and then find the patient. This is really important. This is what... Uh, uh, what the, the couple this morning talked about. If you spoon feed them all their life, they'll never learn how to eat on their own. Find a patient, find your patient, somebody to operate on so that they continue to throw that to them. Uh, and the recovery, hook up with others. Don't try to do this on your own. Uh, it's, it's tough. That's why NMF is around. Uh, we, everybody in NMF that's a part of Biker Ministry has these same kind of things. And we can feed off of each other's confusion, strengths, weaknesses, uh, horrible days, lousy Sundays, those kinds of things. Uh, share your success and your failure. That's why we have the NMS fa Facebook page. Throw it out there because somebody out there is feeling the same way you are and they just need to know that it's just not me. Because when you start to fail, you think, it's gotta be me. Nobody else has these kind of things. Everybody else has these kind of things. I mean, it, there's, there's no difference. Uh, Go to Facebook, join the NMF Associates. Uh, you know, just uh, nmf.nazarene.org is where we have everything. Now, it's so buried in the SDMI uh, website, you got to be a master, webmaster. You found it? Oh, yeah. oh, you just have to keep going further down, further down, further down. Uh, so, uh, but go to NMF Associates and then, you know, just, just do what you can. Now, you've got these, the handout that I gave you, uh, the little trifold flyer there. Uh, none of that information on there is current. Uh, this, was, this was a flyer that we used when we started, uh, after we'd been in about uh, maybe a year, year and a half, I put this trifold flyer out because everywhere we went, we handed this thing out. Uh, and it just says who we are. Uh, it says what we do, or what we did. Uh, it, it's none of the, the addresses, none of the websites are active anymore because I'm not there, I'm in Ohio now. so. Uh, but it, these are the kind of things, anytime you can take a picture of your bikers together doing something, and, and everybody's got a, got a camera now, take pictures of them. Everybody loves to see themselves in a picture. 
And if you can publish it, this, this kind of thing will create excitement within your biker community because guys can take this, they can take it to work, ladies can take it to work, and they go, hey, here's what we're doing. I mean, and you don't have to stand there and talk to somebody for an hour trying to explain what your biker ministry does. Just put something like this together in black and white. It's just eight and a half by 11. Just run it off on a copy or in your printer, fold it, make it look kind of nice. But these are the kind of things that we did. And, uh, and I love the, the, the scripture that we used out of 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 1923. This is on the back of our business cards. Find something like this that you can relate to, that you can say, here's what we do. And uh, I want to read it. It comes from the message. Uh, it's, it sounds really different in any other translation. The message is the very best. Even though I'm free from the demands and expectations of everyone, I voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people. I wanted to put in there muddy people. And had I read this book 12 years ago, that muddy would have been in there. Uh, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralist, loose living immoralist. Roger Peterson just has a way with words that just nails people, nails their personality. The defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ. That's probably the most important one in there. But I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did this because of the message, and I love this part. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. When, you're in on, when your passion is such that you want to be a part of what's going on, you want to be a part of seeing people's lives changed, it's hard to think about anything else. Now, what happens when the passion runs out? Or what happens when you 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 move and you and you're called someplace else? I'm in that now. I I went from being the biker pastor at our church for 11 years, but you have to understand that before that I was a minister of music for 11 years, and I had polo shirts and khaki pants and penny loafers, and I did choirs and musicals and all this kind of stuff. Lord called me to biker ministry, and I swore to Him that He got the wrong guy. I said, I don't even own a bike. Uh, but if he calls you into something, he will equip you for what you need. He'll give you every strength and every material thing that you need for that. So anyway, he calls me into that. He puts me into this situation where now I'm doing something that I'm completely uncomfortable with. But as soon as I surrendered to it, doors began to open in the community towards bikers that I never even knew existed. And it, we just fell into it. And I, and I know that it was the Holy Spirit that was pushing and prodding and leading into it, but it seemed to me that every time I turned around, maybe I never saw it before. Maybe it was always there, but I never saw it. You know how when you're gonna buy a new car and you have a certain car that you wanna buy, suddenly you see hundreds of them on the road where you never saw them before? This was the way it was when I was called to biker ministry. I never even noticed the bike shops, the bars, the bikers, the dealerships, all these kind of things, different models of bikes and everything. But sudden, when my eyes were open to that, it's all I could see. I saw it everywhere, and it's like you got new vision for something. So I'm in that for 11 years, and then I, I, get a, I go through the ordination process, feel called to full-time ministry, go back to school, get my uh, degree, uh, go through the ordination process, become ordained, and suddenly I think that because I've gone through school and now I'm an official elder in the Church of the Nazarene that I need to be doing something inside a church and getting paid for it to justify what I did to get there. And the problem with that is it may not be true, but everybody that is also an ordained elder is pushing you in that direction to say, well, that's what you need to do. You need to get on staff somewhere. So I get on staff at Shepherd, and I'm running a basketball league. Uh, I'm not doing any biker stuff. Uh, I then become the senior adult pastor. So I've got 120 senior adults that I'm pastoring, and I'm still running a basketball league full of children. Uh, and I told the church when I came there, I said, don't really like basketball and don't much care for kids. Uh, and they said, he's perfect, hire him. Uh, so for four years, I ran this basketball program. About a month ago, I'm sitting in my office. I finally handed the basketball program off to somebody that's much more qualified than I am. But I'm sitting in my office and I pull out a journal. We, we journal every trip we take, whatever we do, we, we journal it. So I had details and details in this journal about our first trip out west. And we carried 15 bikers with us, and we went out to do a, a biker Sunday in Libby, Montana. And all the way out, we stopped. We rode 15 days, averaged 550 to 600 miles a day for 15 days. Had a blast. 
those that like to ride had a blast. Uh, <laughs> no, for most of them, it wasn't fun at all. When are we ever going to stop? You know. So uh, are we there yet? Yeah. Uh, but as I read through that manual, and I sit there in my office at Shepherd, I kind of looked up and I went, "What am I doing? What am I doing here? Why have I, why have I suddenly left this?" and gone into something else that was not really my passion, but it felt like what I was supposed to do. So the other day, Mike Benson comes through. I don't know if you all know Mike Benson or not. Super guy. He's on our MF Council. He's a, he's a traveling evangelist and goes everywhere on his bike. He is the national evangelist for the priesthood motorcycle ministry. Uh, he was been, he's been chaplain of Olivet Nazarene University and all this kind of stuff, but now he's an evangelist. Super guy. Really sharp. And uh, I mean, he's, he went to a workshop at M11 or something like that, and suddenly he just bikered up. And, uh, and so he calls me the other day, we'd go have breakfast, and he said, man, I, I'm, just, I'm just tired of being on the road. He said, I think I want to stop, and I think I want to get a position. And, and he, he's thinking about a homeless ministry uh, that a guy is about to retire and need somebody to hand it off to. And I just told him. And I'd had this experience with my little journal, you know, about three days before that. I went, boy, be careful what you ask for. I said, just take a real hard look at what you've got, at what you're doing, at what you're passionate about. And don't, don't let other people try to push you into doing something that you think you need to be doing. I said, gauge your passion. What is it that you love to do? Because if you're doing that, you are most blessed. I mean, you, you have found your sweet spot. Uh, now, I love what I'm doing. Don't get me wrong. I, I love my senior adults. It's, they're nuts. Uh, and, you know, and I love working with them. And I'm still able to do biker ministry. But lately, since I've read that journal, I've just been more open to opportunities for biker ministry. And it seems like I've had wonderful conversations with people that probably I would have passed by, you know, two months ago. Uh, and so I think the Lord, the Lord knows that that passion is still there. And he's, he's, he's taking little drops of opportunity, and he's, he's kind of throwing them at me like that and go, there you go. That'll keep you going for a while. And there you go. And so when things get hard, the Lord knows where your passion is. The Lord knows what he's called you to do, and he will feed that passion and give you opportunity to do things that, that only he can give you opportunities to do. Um, that's what I got. Uh, it's, it, it is not for everybody. Biker ministry is not something that you get into because you have a motorcycle. Uh, I got into it. I didn't have a motorcycle. Uh, it was way after that, before I got a bike. Uh, well, not way after that, but it was a little while. Uh, yeah? You have this little flyer you used to anyhow uh, ride every Sunday afternoon. Yeah. We had, we had a ride at 2 o'clock. Is there an advantage over that from taking uh, the calendar and saying, hey, we'll ride as we do, at least we're trying to do it. Uh, no, we got two on this Saturday. We got yeah. It got old. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I did it for 10 years. I did it for 10 years. We did every Sunday at 2 o'clock. I was in the parking lot of the church. Some Sundays I was, I was pleading, please don't, please don't show up. Please don't, <laughs> please don't anybody come. Because <laughs> I want to go home and take a nap. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and, but, but almost to a time, we would have 10 or 15 bikes show up. And for some of those guys, they didn't go to church anywhere. Yeah. That was their church. And we would, do, we would do good rides. We had about a half a dozen rides that we did regularly. They always ended in an ice cream joint. Uh, so we would, we would always do these rides. I never regretted going on one, ever. I always sometimes didn't want to go on one, but I never regretted. When we got back, when we were done, and what we'd do is we'd leave from the church, we'd ride somewhere, and then when we left the ice cream spot, we'd just go home, you know, wherever we needed to go. But the ride down and the time at, the, at the, whatever this ice cream joint was, for some of those guys, that was when we were able to speak into their lives about the church and about fellowship and about friendship. We never preached. We never did anything. But we, I always had the information for these guys. 
And whenever we would do something special, they'd always show up. And a lot of times we did stuff special at the church. The other thing about it was they, uh, they knew where the church was. So you left from the church parking lot. We always left from the church parking lot. So they always knew where the church was. And a lot of these guys started coming back. On, and then we had a Tuesday night Bible study every week at 7 o'clock. These guys that rode on Sunday would usually come back to the Tuesday night Bible study. And that was a, that was a time when we, we got into the Word pretty deep, you know. And, uh, and we, we'd have 30 and 40 on a Tuesday night Bible study. Uh, and we'd have maybe 10 or 15 on a Sunday. I remember one particular Sunday, it was cold as whiz. I mean, we could ride 12 months in, in, uh, in North Carolina. So, I mean, it was, it had to be, it was well below freezing. It was probably 16 or 17 degrees. I mean, I had every piece of dead cow I could get on me. And I'm sitting in the parking lot and I'm going, please, please, please. And I'm looking, it's like one till two. So I'm, I'm getting ready to crank her up because two o'clock I'm out of there, you know, and I'm going the back way. So if somebody comes in the front way, they'll think I'm not there. And right at two o'clock, I hear, he's turning the corner and coming up, and it's this dude, and he's just got a bike, and he's all hyped up, you know, for biking and all that kind of stuff. So Tony Restivo, Pancake was his name. He rides in. He's got like a jacket, no chaps, no gloves, you know, just a little old skull cap. And uh, so he pulled up. I was so angry. He said, where are we going? <laughs> I picked the place that was the furthest away from the church. I mean, it was a good 45-minute ride. So we're going down to Dairyland. And uh, so he falls in behind me. We go down to Dairyland. It's, it's got to be 15 degrees. And by the time we get down there, we're, I mean, I've got leather on. And when we get down there, I can't get my helmet off because my fingers are just froze. And I'm going, oh, what the? And he goes, well, what, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to get some ice cream. So we go in, we get our ice cream. <laughs> And I go outside on the porch. He goes, where are you going? I said, we're bikers. We eat our ice cream on the porch. <laughs> <laughs> we sat out there in these rocking chairs on the porch, 15 degrees, eating ice cream. And we were just both hypothermic <laughs> like crazy. But he never showed up by himself again. <laughs> we still talk about that. I got an email from him the other day. He went, had any good cold ice cream lately? And... Uh, but it's those kinds of experiences that you don't get any other way than if you have something that's there all the time. Was it a nuisance? Yeah. Did I hate it some Sundays? Absolutely. But most Sundays, uh, I couldn't think of anything else I'd rather do. And I miss it so much now. I mean, I think about those 2 o'clock rides. And Sharon, my wife, she rides too. Uh, she rarely went because it was usually cold. And she doesn't like ice cream. So, I mean, she, you know, and I always left it up there. I never made her go, you know. She went sometimes, but uh, if we were going somewhere close. But uh, she didn't like it. And I told the other day, actually, when I was looking at this, and I read this when I was getting ready to bring it down here, I thought, man, I miss those Sunday rides. She went, you're kidding. <laughs> and I go, no, I really do. But, I mean, we would do things like long trips. And, and, you know, these are pictures of some of our biker Sundays up in there. And, you know, we, I think the most we ever had a biker Sunday was like, almost 400 bikes, 376 bikes or something like that. And I mean, that is an awesome thing. It ended up being the biggest thing that ever happened at our church every year. It was huge. It was bigger than Easter, bigger than Christmas. It, Biker Sunday, our, and our church really bought into it. They, they just loved it. Uh, and the bikers didn't pay anything. They got free lunch. We, had, we actually had a Saturday night service and a Saturday night ride and to, to have a night ride with 150 motorcycles being led by, by State Highway Patrol, and, at every, and this was out in the country, so at every intersection, we would go through like 10 or 12 intersections, at every intersection, the local volunteer fire department would block those intersections for us. And it was so cool, because you'd be riding at night, and if you're in the back, you just see red taillights just doing this, you know, through the trees and stuff. And if you're in the front, you're looking back, it's just a, a white snake going everywhere. So the guy that would lead it was a sheriff's deputy, and he, he was a biker, but he would do his, his patrol car that night, and he had CECOM, you know, in his car, and he would call ahead, and he had the CECOM for all of these fire departments. And you'd be riding along, and all of a sudden, just be pitch black, and all of a sudden, this, this intersection would just light up. And there'd be four fire engines, a couple of EMTs, you know, all that kind of stuff, and it would just blaze with, with light, red light and, and white lights, and we'd just scoot right through that intersection, and and uh, it was so cool. And people would just come back to the church, and they would almost be in tears 
because they had never experienced anything like that before. And that, that grew our church because it was done well and because it was bigger than anything anybody had ever seen. Uh, it's not that big now because the passion's not there. Uh, uh, it's still there, but it's just barely there. Uh, in fact, I think this year is the first year in 13 years that they will not have a biker Sunday there. They still have a Tuesday night Bible study, but they're not going to have a biker Sunday. They just don't have, there's nobody to lead it. The lady that led it, and this is another thing to be careful about, and it, it speaks to yours, Ron. The lady that led it could not delegate. She did everything, and it burned her out. She did it for like three years, and she said, I can't do it anymore. And uh, so, you know, we, we would set up a committee. I would have a committee of people, and I'd go, your food, your music, your preaching, your, you know, escort, your parking lot, your T-shirts, your registration, your pins, your, you know, and everybody had a thing they did. And I said, if you need anything, let me know. If not, don't want to hear from you. So and, when you uh, did Biker's <coughs> you had the whole Sunday? Oh, the whole Sunday, okay. yeah. So yeah. Ushers, everything? Everything, everything. Okay. This is a picture, that's a picture of our Biker Sunday, uh, 2004, I think where we had close to 400 bikes. Uh, that's the parking lot outside. That's the sanctuary inside. There was not an empty seat. If the fire marshal hadn't actually been a biker and been there that day, <laughs> we would have been shut down uh, because we were way over capacity. Uh, a couple of Sundays we had to uh, cat five monitors down the back hall, and we had people sitting in the hallway with TV monitors. And that was, that was never a thing that happened to our church. We had a church of 200. We'd have 800 at Biker Sunday in a 400-seat building. And it was crazy. It was just crazy. But, uh, it, I mean, it was really blessed of the Lord. And, uh, but I loved it. I, I, I ate it. I drank it. It was my every waking moment. And it was while I was going back to school to get my degree. And so I wasn't working. So I was full-time biker ministry. Not everybody has that luxury, uh, you know, and, and I don't have that luxury now. Um, Did you have anything for children that showed up with? Yeah, we, we had bicycles. We asked them to ride their bicycles. And uh, the, the parents would bring them. We had a place to drop off down the street so they could actually ride in. Uh, we, had, we had people with posters saying, Powerline loves bikers. You know, the, the, all the classes would line up as the, as the people came in. And this was the coolest thing because Bikers never expected this kind of reception from a church. So when they would come down that the driveway, main driveway into the church, and all these people are going, Powerline loves bikers, you know, welcome to Biker Sunday, that kind of thing, and waving and clapping as they came in. And I got that from Steve Grove at, Gro at uh, Grove City. I mean, Steve Combs at Grove City. Boy, the first time I went to one of their Biker Sundays, you went down this long driveway, and there were hundreds of people lining it, just clapping for you as you came in. And you couldn't help but get cold chills and just, I mean, th we had guys coming in there were weeping because they'd never experienced anything like this openness in a church and this acceptance just because they were bikers. And some of these were outlaw guys. We had a, we had a Hell's Angel uh, uh, prospect group that was called uh, Road Ramblers in the area. And uh, these guys came. I ended, I'd ended up doing a funeral for a Hell's Angels guy because of this thing. And, and uh, I mean, the, the opportunities for ministry were just absolutely incredible. There were some scary times, but but it was fun. And you're having a bike run next Saturday? Next Sunday, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow's, tomorrow's our biker Sunday, yeah. What's the 20th that I saw somewhere? I don't know. Um, but anyway, any other questions? All right. Well, you exceeded my expectations. I didn't think I'd have but three. <laughs> Is there an advantage to, uh, or disadvantage no, it's to it's always under motorcycle riders. organizing right. it through, uh, through the church as opposed to like this subculture? Oh, the biker churches? Or this parachurch or something? What we found, what we have found with biker churches, particularly churches like uh, BFC has a church called Rushing Wind and it's out of California, and the BFC chapters, if they get large enough, BFC has always said you have to be a part of a church to be a part of Bikers for Christ. It has to be founded in a church. So there are some bikers that don't have a church. Some BFC guys don't have a church, and so they've, they've founded their own biker church called Rushing Wind. There's a couple of them in Ohio. 
Um, and Wayne is experiencing this in South Carolina where a couple of guys broke off from his biker ministry because they wanted a church that was just bikers. What happens when you do, and Steve Combs did the same thing with Levermark. Right. Left Grove City, started Levermark Church, which was just bikers. Right. Most of those churches end up just being churches, not biker churches, because the bikers find out that they, they lost the enthusiasm that they had as a ministry within a church. They lost their identity as bikers because now everybody in the church is a biker and there's nothing special about it. There's nothing unique. People don't look at them weird when they walk in. They're starting to feed off of that. You know, they were starting to go, here come the bikers. Well, at a biker church, everybody's a biker. So what's happening is the bikers are leaving the biker churches, but they're not going back to the biker ministries. They're just going back to their old way of life. Uh, and so Wayne is finding that there is a creep that takes place from the, the inside the church biker ministry to a biker church to back in the old ways, you know, back to the clubs and back to the bars and that kind of thing. And so I told Wayne, I said, so, go get them again. Because what Wayne's finding out, same thing I found out when we had the biker ministry at Powerline, bikers are the hardest working people in your church because they don't know the church rules. They don't know that when they have a work day for the nursery, if you don't have little kids, you don't have to come and work in that work day. They just show up. And so and when Tim Taylor was our pastor in, in North Carolina, he said, we had all this stuff ready, but we didn't have nearly enough because we had like 50 bikers show up for work day. And he said, what are you guys doing here? He said, you're painting the nursery, aren't you? <laughs> and he went, but you don't, have any, you don't have any kids in the nursery. What's that got to do with it? You know, so, you know, nobody told them the church rules, so they just show up. So Tim loved it. He said, we got some of the hardest workers there ever are. And he said, you better have stuff ready because these guys are riding at 12, whether the work's done or not. So at 8 o'clock, you better have the paint brushes ready and the paint laid out and the drop cloths down and ready to paint because at noon, they're out of here. Uh, and so that was one of the benefits of having the biker ministry in the church was that you had a whole new group of people that were not church people. And they, were, they had found a place where people loved them for who they were. Uh, the, the, the guy that got saved, our first biker that got saved, his name was Clyde Ward. He came to our church on the first biker Sunday that we ever had, which has 76 bikes on that one, which just blew me away. I didn't think anybody would come. Uh, we had a, a, a place called Chrome Alley, which was a bike, uh, sort of like a bike shop without bikes. They sold parts and chrome and that kind of stuff. The two guys there were Christian. They gave us their mailing list of 300 people. That was huge. Uh, and so we sent postcards to 300 people that had been shopping at their bike shop, which literally was almost every biker in the Burlington area. And uh, 76 people came from that one postcard and from some posters that we put up in the YMCA and, and a couple of bars and places and bike shops downtown, the Harley dealership. Uh, and so they all came, and this guy named Clyde Ward hadn't been to church in 30 years because he was an old-school biker. Uh, he, he rode a wide glide, but he had rheumatoid arthritis, so he had to have a cane, so he stuck his cane down in beside his saddlebag, and that's how he got around. He'd get off his bike, and he'd walk in. So we came that day, and everybody was, nobody was in a suit. They all had T-shirts and do-rags on. He came in, and he said, I had found a home. And he went down the altar that day in that elementary school and, and got saved. And... Uh, unbelievable just unbelievable and uh, I mean it, stories like that happened almost every week as we first got started uh, and that's exciting when that happens but it's that doesn't always happen and that momentum doesn't always keep going and so you have to be willing to just stay with it you know and uh, it, it's hard sometimes it can be you get some victories that'll keep you going for a while but you don't get one every Sunday or every week so is the NMF United States-wide? It's worldwide. We've got some international guys, yeah. That uh, we got a guy who wants us to come to Australia and do an NMF meeting there. Australia Ken Lewis, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, we meet him at General Assembly every year. He says, when you coming? <laughs> yeah, when you coming? So anything else? Thank Appreciate you coming. Thank Thanks. You very much.